Fighting games are a genre that has always been associated with the home. When the primary appeal of it is to fight against friends one-on-one -on, -one on some large display, it typically doesn't lend itself well to tiny personal screens and even tinier buttons. While fighting games have certainly existed on portable platforms for a while, it wasn't until fairly recently that they've been able to be brought onto these smaller machines with relatively few downgrades in comparison to their more advanced console counterparts. Usually this portable form factor might be helpful for training on the go, but it also comes with the caveat that playing these types of games on such small devices can be an absolute disaster for your hands. Of course, despite that, it certainly didn't stop developers from trying every now and then, and there are certainly a few portable consoles that were able to pass that barrier and become well associated with the genre. Consoles like the Neo Geo Pocket Color, PlayStation Portable, and Vita were all excellent for fighters. But what about the forever reigning king of the industry? Poor Nintendo. Between the golden age of the SNES and the renaissance of the Switch, Traditional fighting games seem to be pretty adverse to their other hardware, but some brave devs would try their best anyway. After all, why not try to fill a gap on the most popular handhelds in the market? This brings us to Nintendo's very last entirely dedicated handheld console, the 3DS. I'm not really sure how many other people think about this, but the first couple of years of the system's life were very interesting as you had developers trying to transition their sort of DS design sensibilities over to the new and more powerful 3DS. And this resulted in a lot of pretty unique titles during the first couple of years of the system's life. Alongside this, you also had some PSP ports being scattered along there and even some ports of some major console titles from the past that probably didn't run too well on the platform, but are still really impressive to see nowadays anyway. There's quite a few of these titles outside of the fighting genre I could discuss, but I believe the console's very small selection of fighting games were the most intriguing of all. How were they? These classic console and arcade franchises being translated to a machine that wasn't even the best fit for them as a handheld fighting machine at the time. Let's take it outside. Oh, and I should also warn y'all that most of the footage for this video was recorded using emulation, so some games might have some issues with stuttering, flashing, etc. I'll put up text on the screen for particularly bad moments, but, but I'm just letting you guys know since they don't really look like this in real hardware. Anyhow... It's well known that the launch lineup of the 3DS was pretty damn weak by Nintendo's usual standards. All three of the major first-party titles range from mediocre to just okay. Even if Pilot Wings was an alright tech demo, I guess. Third-party titles were mostly in the okay to alright range. But there was one title that was unanimously considered the best game on the system during its first few months. And of all the games it could be, it was a port of the biggest fighting game at the time. Super Street Fighter IV 3D Edition might be a little more than a neat little curiosity now. But when it released, it was pretty damn impressive. And to this day, it still kinda is. As a 3DS launch game, SF4 3D had the task of showcasing the handheld's power and its fun new gimmicks. While the fact that this was a port of an HD console game made the former pretty obvious, you could kinda take or leave the new features added to try and sell the 3DS. Of course, little needs to be said about the actual gameplay of SF4. It's considered one of the most important fighting games of all time for a damn good reason. And that gameplay is held up extremely well here. Yes, the graphics aren't quite as good as the console versions, and it runs at half the frame rate with static stage backgrounds, but even in comparison to some of the PSP's best fighters, it looked really nice. Running it in 3D only made it better. Oh, this port looks miles above the quote-unquote mobile port of SF4, which are right on crappy touch controls and very ugly pre-rendered sprites. Oh right, speaking of touch controls. Taking a concept already utilized in several DS fighting games, Street Fighter 4 3D gives players the option to use special move shortcuts in the bottom screen. It's easy to see how this kind of breaks the game in several ways by making what would normally be complex and precise special move inputs into a simple press of a button. While this does mean it's the only Street Fighter game where I can consistently do a 720 input, the fact that you can do that while walking in any direction makes the game way too easy. Still, I think it's a kind of fun feature if you don't take it too seriously. Not like anyone actually did back in the day. While in terms of the base gameplay this was the biggest addition, there were a few new modes made to emphasize the 3DS's fancy new features. The 3D versus mode changes the point of view to be over your character's shoulder. This is meant to make the 3D effect look even more impressive, but yeah, it's kind of just a gimmick that you will use for a couple matches and never look at again. There's also figures which you could trade with other players via Street Pass. Man, remember Street Pass? Or Spot Pass? Honestly, the 3DS had so many fun experiments with social features that just sorta got dropped in the transition to the Switch. I guess Spot Pass still kinda exists since automatic game updates are so common now, 
but Street Pass is just kind of dead. Still, when you get figures, you could see player stats and how good they were at the game. You could also make figures fight against each other and view them in the gallery. It's a neat little feature, even if it's barely gonna see any use these days. Oh shit, play coins? Damn, that's another blast from the past. Honestly though, I'm not really sure how many people actually had friends who also owned Street Fighter 4 3D. Especially in the first year of the console when the game was most popular, but the 3DS was the least popular. Thankfully, online play exists. Well, thankfully in massive air quotes because this was 2011 fighting game that goed on the 3DS. It's absolutely awful, but for many it was probably the only way to play against other people back in the day. However, if you had a friend who owned a 3DS but not Street Fighter 4, you could use download play to fight in one-on-one -on -one Ryu mirror matches. Okay, yeah, maybe there's a reason why this port is barely discussed these days. But damn, it really does look good. Seriously, I'm just gonna say again that the fact that this port looks as close to the console version as it does is frankly astounding for it being a launch title. I'm sure if the new 3DS existed back then, it would've even found a way for it to run at 60fps. Sure, it's way easier to see how they pulled it off in emulation, but on actual hardware, when combined with a really nice 3D effect, the only noticeable difference really is the lack of movement in the backgrounds. I don't really expect to see SF4 port to any other portable consoles in the near future, but there are certainly more faithful ports of other Capcom fighting classics and other handhelds. The MT Framework mobile engine used for this port would end up becoming Capcom's primary portable engine throughout their entire 3DS and even PS Vita library. The Vita ports of Street Fighter Cross Tekken and Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 are arguably even more impressive, but that's a whole other console that I'll probably cover another time. Capcom really did some good as the first fighting game developers on Nintendo's portable machine. The next fighting game to hit the 3DS was another port of a pre-existing console game, although in this case the same game already had a portable port on a competing handheld, and arguably the game was a bit superior there. Arc System Works and Nintendo have had a pretty weird relationship with ports stepping back to the Game Boy Advance, with the absolutely legendary Guilty Gear X port. I will absolutely discuss that at some point, but did you also know that there was a dedicated 4-player Guilty Gear title on the DS, and an exclusive DSiWare game? I'm not lying when I say my first exposure to GG was the spin-off starring this weird Tofu Man persona of series creator Daisuke Ishiwatari. Related to that, Arxis also released a special parody Blaze Blue spinoff on DSiWare. Blaze Blue Super Melee Brawler's Battle Royale was a kinda shitty arena fighter, but it was the first time the franchise appeared on the Nintendo console. It took until the 3DS for an actual port of one of these games to appear, however. Thinking back on it, I guess the DSiWare game was actually my first exposure to the franchise, but I certainly remember reading about the port of Blaze Blue Continuum Shift 2 back in the day. Out of all the installments in the series, for whatever reason this was the one that got the most iterations, and it confused the hell out of me for years until I actually got into the franchise myself. To clarify, Continuum Shift 2 was not a sequel to Continuum Shift. That would be Chrono Phantasma. Rather, it's mostly just an update to the game that added an additional character and some new story content which is also exactly what the later extended version of the game did. Look, PB is a complicated franchise and I could probably talk about it for hours, but now is not the time. Also, Central Fiction and Cross Tag are getting rollbacks, so if you want to experience plays, we'll play those instead, please. Probably the biggest issue I remember people having with this port was its controls. While most other 3DS fighting games allowed you to use the generally more comfortable circle pad for inputs, BB required you to use the D-pad. On the original 3DS models, the D-pad wasn't too great, and later ones are a bit better but still not particularly noteworthy. I don't know, maybe I'm just used to it now since I've been playing so much of these games. This is partly kinda why I suspect the 3DS didn't see much traditional fighters past its first year, since by comparison not only was the Vita more powerful, but it also had a vastly superior D-pad, arguably the best on any handheld console. Aside from that though, the gameplay is mostly fine considering the 3DS's form factor, Unlike most of the other fighting games in the system, there aren't any touchscreen shortcuts for special inputs, but you can still view the move list on the bottom screen, which is a really nice feature. I think it works better here than in Dead or Alive, which used a bottom screen for the same feature, since BB's move lists are generally much smaller than the massive ones you see in most 3D fighters. On the other hand, the visuals and audio have been heavily downgraded compared to the console versions, which is a bit weird to see coming from how impressive SF4 looked, but I suppose it was to make sure the game ran at a consistent frame rate if it actually did. It's not terrible, but in comparison to the actual 3D fighters, Blaze was a weirdly inconsistent frame rate that's certainly above 30, but definitely not locked at 60. Although, with the hack new 3DS, you can set the game to use the improved CPU, 
and it will actually run at a consistent 60fps whether the 3D is on or off. BB is the kind of game that heavily benefits from modern performance with its faster pace and more involved mechanics, so it's kind of disappointing that they couldn't manage to make it perform too well despite looking less impressive than other games in the system. The very small amounts of later 2D fighting games in 3DS didn't really suffer from this problem, despite having much more detailed sprites and 3D backgrounds. Despite all that I've said though, the 3D implementation here is simple, but it does truly help the sprites pop, and being able to view the more elaborate astral finish animations in 3D is really nice. Thankfully, there's not really anything else cut back when it comes to other content in the game. The entire story mode is still here, fully voice acted and everything. I'm really sorry. I fell on you. You! Yes. Unfortunately, my flight mode malfunctioned. It seems even you- I want to emphasize that point just a bit more. While this was also the case on PSP for years, the ridiculous amount of voice dual audio dialogue in this game must have been extremely impressive back in the day to Nintendo fans, who were still used to having maybe only sporadic voice lines in their games with the exception of a few Japan-only titles like Nino Kuni. Sure, the audio is super compressed, but it's an effort that I can still appreciate to this day. Thanks to Arxis' effort to keep all the content intact, this port was actually how I experienced a good portion of CS's story mode. Back in the day, this was the only portable version of the game I had, and it made experiencing the story much more comfortable compared to watching it all unfold on my big TV. That's really the best part of this port, although with the existence of the extended version on Vita, it's certainly not the best way to experience the story or a portable version of the game in general, anymore. In addition to the story, you also have the Legion and Abyss modes to retain, providing the game with tons of content well beyond most other fighters on the system, or hell, even in general. A lot of modern fighting games forget just how important having all of this meaty single player is, and it's always great to come back to older ones and seeing just how much they were able to do. Of course, CS2 would not really become much of a success on 3DS. Later, BB ports would stick to the Vita, and it wasn't until the Switch received ports of cross tag Battle and Central Fiction several years later that the franchise returned to Nintendo, with the exception of a lone 3DS spin-off. Following up the DSi's Blaze Blue, Blaze Blue Clone Phantasma is a beat-em-up featuring the same chippy art style, but based on Chrono Phantasma. It's another... Eh, game? Not really worth discussing much beyond the fact it even exists. It's just a mediocre beat-em-up. Were there even any Blaze Blue fans like a Nintendo that appreciated these? Let me know if that was the case. As far as I know, Blaze Blue Continuum Shift 2 ended up being the only 2D sprite based fighting game port that made it to the 3DS. In comparison to the amount the PSP got, it's kinda disappointing, but not really surprising. Clearly, developers wanted to take more advantage of the 3D capabilities of the system, which Blaze Blue did not really use in any way. Out of all the ports, it certainly benefited the least from the new hardware. Will future games suffer the same fate? We shall see. You ready for another port? Well, actually, this one kind of stresses the definition of that. Thank God. Hell, when it comes to a conversion of a classic 3D home console fighting game series, this one is probably the very best on the system. Dead or Alive Dimensions was Koei Tecmo's answer to the great 3DS fighting game war. And it's pretty dang good, all things considered. As for why DOA got a game on a 3DS, do you even need to ask? DOA tends to get a bit of a bad rap when compared to its 3D fighting peers like Tekken, Soul Calibur, and Virtual Fighter. Despite mostly being infamous for its sheer level of fan service, the actual gameplay has always been quite fun, and the series' emphasis on over the top dynamic stages and accessible gameplay has always made its entry some of the most visually impressive fighting games on pretty much every platform it's made an appearance on. Of course, this is more of a spin off than a totally new title, and making new assets is hard so DOA D appears to be primarily based on DOA 3, although it uses the same engine as DOA 4 apparently. DOA 2 and 3 were absolutely amazing looking games for their time, and it's impressive that Dimensions chose to focus on adapting 3 rather than the less visually intensive 2. Not only that, but they even included the new characters from DOA 4, even made some of the boss characters from prior games playable as well. Of course, that doesn't mean everything got translated without compromise. Stages in here in particular are a bit lower quality and less animated than their console counterparts. However, plenty of the iconic area transitions are still left intact. The character models also look fantastic, with the animations and dynamic camera movement remaining just as good as the home version. The only real problem with the visual presentation is that it's capped at 30fps during cutscenes and when running in 3D. 
kinda expected, but at least you can just turn it off and enjoy that smooth 60fps goodness. In addition to the content ported from the main DOI series, there's also a brand new stage based on Metroid FRM. Around the time of this game's release, there was a lot of people who were hoping Samus would manage to make it into the guest character. But unfortunately, she only shows up as a background element in her own stage. Alongside Ridley, of course, who just absolutely fucks up anyone who falls out of the stage or gets in the way of his fireballs. The stage is excellent, but you can't deny that something like Samus would have been a great addition to make this version truly special. Still, as it is, it's still quite nice. There's tons of modes to mess around with, from the standard 1v1 fighting, arcade and survival mode, to a fully original to this version story mode which recaps the entire DOA series up to this point. This mode also acts as a surprisingly good tutorial for the series' general gameplay. Fighting game tutorials are a whole other topic that plenty of other people have already given their thoughts on, but I really appreciated how Dimensions does it. Each mechanic is essentially introduced with a quick time event with info about the technique displayed on the bottom screen. In my opinion, this helped me learn the mechanics of DOA much more naturally than other fighting games that tend to rely on isolated tutorial or challenge modes for this kind of thing. I know it's not the only fighting game to do something like this, but it's certainly been the smoothest of the ones I've tried. With all of this together, it somehow makes this small 3DS game the best way of catching up with the DOA story and learning how it works, even if it isn't as graphically impressive as most of its home console counterparts. Similar to SF4 3D, you can also collect a bunch of figures, which, yeah, you can probably guess why such a thing was included. You can pose them around to make your own cool, customized fight scenes. Seriously though, I don't really have much experience with DOA, but I can't deny it, it is an incredibly solid fighter through and through. And Dimensions is arguably the best fighting game port, if you can even call it that, on the console. Compared to everything else, there were very few compromises taken here, with tons of additions that actually give fans a reason to play it, beyond just being a neat little curiosity. Blaze Blue might just barely surpass it in terms of overall content, but with an at the time pretty complete roster and excellent smooth 3D gameplay, it truly is the most 3DS of all the 3DS fighting games. The only thing I'd really put against this port is that the initial roster of characters is very small in order to incentivize you to play through the story mode. I personally prefer when fighting games let you play with every character from the start, but I understand wanting to have some extra semblance of progression in a handheld port that's mostly going to be played solo anyway. And since it is relevant, I suppose I could also mention that the Vita would receive its own fairly impressive DOA port later on with Dead or Alive 5 Plus. Does that invalidate dimensions? Less than you'd actually think. But hey, so great for the time. Winner! Congratulations to me! One of the main reasons why the 3DS even existed as it did was due to the popularity of 3D films around the time of the console's development. When the system was announced, Nintendo even said they were going to partner with various film studios to release 3D films on the tiny handheld. That, uh, didn't really happen as you probably know. There was that Nintendo video app, which brought us plenty of classic shorts like Dinosaur Office and Air Shark. No shade of Dinosaur Office, that was kind of fun back in the day. But the short part was probably the most notable thing there. Nintendo knew it wasn't really a good idea to have the 3D on for an entire full-length movie, so all of their efforts to get into the space were for content under 10 minutes long. While this did result in the fantastic Kid Icarus Uprising shorts and the Kirby Right Back Atcha revival, I always wondered if any other full movies would ever be released for the system. Note how I said other, because one game in the very first year of the 3DS strived to do just that. Namco decided to bring their A games to the handheld by porting a PSP port of a console game with little content and bundling it with a full-length, heavily compressed 3D movie in beautiful 240p. Yep, it's Tekken 3D Prime Edition. Now, this video is primarily about the small selection of traditional fighting games in the console, but I just wanted to inform you just what the state of videos on 3DS was because outside of Tekken there was maybe like one or two other films that got full 3D releases on the console and they were only available in Japan. Namco was absolutely banking on fans' desire to see this big epic action movie on a tiny compressed screen just because it was now viewable in frankly unimpressive 3D. And I like the 3D on the 3DS, this was just a bad conversion of it. Can't really say anything about the actual film itself, it's fine if you like Tekken more and want to see a longer version of the series' awesome cutscenes. So, Mr. Lee- Excellent! Excellent! Oh, excellent! As for the game itself, I mean, it is sort of Tekken 6. All of your 12 stances and Electric God Windfists are present and accounted for. 
This particular version is based on the 2009 PSP port. So a lot of the game's assets are still kind of just downgraded versions of stuff in the PS2 and arcade versions of 5. But now they're in 3D, and it runs at 60 FPS. Honestly, when it comes to visuals, plus number of characters, this is probably one of the most impressive fighting games in the hardware. While DOA ran and looked really great at 2D, that was capped at 30 FPS when you turned 3D on. Now, I'm not sure how true this is, but apparently this aspect of the port was so impressive, it's the reason why Nintendo hired Namco to develop the next Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS. Clearly, Namco knew their way around the 3DS hardware. While it is subtle, there are a few visual improvements over the PSP version when it comes to general texture slash model quality, at least for the characters. Some elements of each character's outfit pops out a little more on the 3DS version. However, the actual stages tend to look much less impressive on 3DS compared to PSP. This might be because some of the 3DS stages are based on Tekken 5s, but even the original versions of those looked a lot better by virtue of being on the more powerful PS2 hardware with twice the resolution. Sure, when you're playing on a smaller screen, the differences are negligible, but when emulating you do start to notice this stuff. The PSP version also had a true 16x9 aspect ratio, but admittedly it's a fairly subtle difference compared to whatever the 3DS uses. Of course, in motion both games look pretty fantastic for their hardware, arguably being some of the smoothest and prettiest fighting games on their system with a large number of characters to go along with them. What I can't say is large on 3DS though is the amount of content. The number of modes is absolutely paltry, and there's very little incentive to play through the game's single-player modes. The PSP version actually contained all of the character headings of the console edition, along with plenty of additional modes not present on 3DS, including a far more in-depth character customization system. On 3DS you have a bland survival mode, a bland arcade mode with no story and no endings, and a card collecting mode which rewards you with low-quality JPEGs of characters from Tekken history. There's a lot of 3DS games which did some more stuff to this. Hell, DOA and Street Fighter 4 3D Edition did this. But, you know, they usually at least had a description or something to make collecting them a bit more interesting. The other games literally did this better. There's just not really much to do here. You could say that extra solo content got replaced with the addition of a full movie. But I'd personally prefer to have more game and things to unlock in-game than just an hour and a half long, highly compressed movie on a tiny screen. It makes Tekken 3D, despite being an excellent game at its core, feel kind of empty with the lack of stuff to really do in it. If you want to experience this demade version of Tekken 6, the PSP is certainly better for it. That version actually has unique story modes for each character, the original ending cutscenes, and actual character customization with plenty of accessories to unlock. The only thing that version is really lacking is some of the original soundtrack made specifically for the 3DS, which is really great. I mean, here are some of it right here. <laughs> And this is good and all, but you know. Tekken 6's original soundtrack is also pretty great too. Probably the most damning thing about this version may not even be its lack of content, but its release date when you look at that lack of content alongside it. Going into making this video, I thought that this port came out around the same time as the rest of the fighting games on 3DS, sometime in mid to late 2011 or so. This came out in February 2012. For the record, Tekken 6 on PSP came out in December of 2009. Considering another version of Portable Tekken had already been out for over two years, it was larger the same if not just straight up a better game, it makes 3D frankly kind of embarrassing. It truly makes DOA Dimensions with its bounceful content look that much better by comparison. And that was only three months after 3DS launched. Before we wrap up on Tekken though, I did want to mention a sim or bundle that came out around this time. The PS3 received Tekken Hybrid, which also included the Blood Vengeance movie, alongside a remaster of Tekken Tag Tournament and a demo for Tekken Tag Tournament 2. Compared to Tekken 3D, this is obviously just a way better package since Tekken Tag just has way more content even if the roster is a little bit smaller than Tekken 6's. Plus, there is Tekken Bowl, so there is no more arguments to be made. Having a demo of Tekken Tag 2 was just icing on the cake. Even if the number of playable characters was small, it was something truly new to do at the time. Combine that with the movie actually being in HD and having 3D support and compatible TVs, Hybrid is pretty much Tekken 3D, but better. 
Damn, we've really gotten this far without mentioning a single fighting game based on an anime or manga series? To be fair, I wanted to focus this video on traditional style fighting games. And some anime fighters on 3DS aren't traditional 2D fighters. This includes the first My Hero video game, as well as a few untranslated One Piece games. The original DS was absolutely stuffed with anime-based fighting games, but by comparison, they mostly fell by the wayside on 3DS. Of course, there's a few franchises that you can never stop, and the one anime series to get its own original and somewhat traditional 2D fighting game game on the 3DS was... Dragon Ball! Extreme Butsuden, released in 2015. On paper, this is a pretty damn impressive fighting game for the 3DS. Looking at these sprites with this IP and being done by Arc System Works, how can this game possibly fail? Well, I guess it manages to land mostly safely, but it certainly leaves a lot to be desired. Extreme Butsuden is a very basic fighter, with simple dialogue combos and small special move lists. While it feels fine in all its move around, damn near everything in the game costs meter, and you're barely going to be able to get enough when the game mostly sends groups of one or two opponents against you. Your basic attacks can be alright, but this beam button is downright pitiful for a lot of characters. Interestingly, when selecting, the game utilizes a sort of ratio system. Each character costs a specific number of points, with higher valued characters obviously being far better than the less valued ones. So characters like Krillin will barely deal any damage, but others like Boo, Broly, and Beerus deal ridiculous amounts of damage by default. Points are a factor with the loads of assist characters, which you can choose two of to replace a single character slot. Now, this does sound like it could be an interesting idea on paper. But the problem is, at least as far as I know, the game never actually restricts how many points you have. You're pretty much always capped at 35 points, which is enough to choose any combination of even the most powerful characters or assists. I feel like this could have been balanced a bit better, maybe by making playable characters more expensive overall, since having Goku Blue was probably going to be more valuable than having an assist character with only one attack, even if that attack is pretty powerful sometimes. Hell, Shenron can literally revive a team member, but costs the same as Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, who just uses a powerful but pretty standard beam attack. That's not even going to the rather disappointing roster. You have a fair portion of the main cast and the big villains, but there's a lot of pretty important characters that are relegated to being assists. We have four separate versions of just Goku himself playable, but neither Gogeta or Vegito. Pretty standard characters like Tien, Yamcha, and Antred 16 and 17 are relegated to assists too. Hell, Omega Shinrod is counted as the main villain of the game's adventure mode, but he's also just an assist. The only character in this game that you'd be missing from from Fighter Z is Rabbits and uh, young kid Gohan. Although, despite my issues with the playable roster selection, there are a lot of pretty neat picks for the assist cast with plenty of obscure characters gaining some spotlight. It's still overall not the most balanced thing in the world, but it was pretty okay before we had a better take on 2D Dragon Ball fighting, even if there may have been some prior 2D Dragon Ball fighting games that would have been better too. That, and for the 3DS, especially these sprites look excellent. Not quite as animated as the ones we got in Blaze Blue, but the detail is far better. The stages being in full 3D too is not a plus. Unfortunately, we only got uh, one language for voice audio, instead of the dual audio that we got in Blaze Blue, but the voices are still pretty compressed despite that. There's plenty of modes to go through, including the obligatory Dragon Ball Z story recap mode, which has some what-if scenarios starring various characters from the main crew. There is also the adventure mode, which if you've played the story mode for Fighter Z, is pretty similar to that, but this is how you unlock most of the assist characters and a few of the remaining fighters. It can certainly get a bit repetitive and monotonous, but at least you're earning stuff along the way. Something that's also pretty damn important to note is the extremely similar One Piece fighting game that was also made by Arxis and came out about a year later exclusively in Japan. One Piece Great Pirates Coliseum plays more or less identically to Extreme Butsuden, so I don't really need to explain more about its gameplay since it also suffers from many of the same issues as Dragon Ball. The big difference here though is that One Piece just kind of naturally lends itself towards having a more varied cast of playable characters, which does give this game a slight edge over DVD's relatively homogenized cast. For the record, I know barely anything about One Piece, so I can't really say much beyond that, like what characters that could have been playable aren't and other shit. The single player modes do seem to be a bit different, but I can't read this shit, so I'm not gonna bother looking into it anymore. By far, the most interesting bit about both of these games is the fact that they feature cross-compatibility with one another. That means you could have crossplay between two separate fighting games, effectively turning it into one big Dragon Ball vs. One Piece crossover fighter. This is honestly such a cool feature that I've never heard any other fighting game really do. I guess it's most similar to how Pokemon games, particularly during the fourth generation, could battle against each other. But this is a little bit more complex than that. 
It's like if you could have, I don't know, Grand Blue and DNF Duel go against each other, or Blaze Blue and Persona 4. Oh, wait, that already exists. It's clear that Extreme Boots then is what opened the gateways for Arxis and Bandai Namco to heavily approve on the concept with Dragon Ball Fighter Z, which cut out the assist characters in favor of a more well rounded and focused roster with exceptionally better gameplay that has only gotten better over time. The fact that it started with a simple 3DS fighter just makes it all the more interesting. Now, of course, aside from all these, there were a few other major fighting games on the 3DS. Alongside the aforementioned anime fighters, there was also the most iconic fighting game on the handheld, Super Smash Brothers, for a Nintendo 3DS. Without a doubt, it's one of the most well-known games on the system that several players devoted hundreds of hours to while demolishing the circle pads along the way. But it wasn't the only platform fighter on there. Before Smash, there was Cartoon Network Punch Time Explosion, which tried to fill the niche much earlier in the 3DS's life. Not really as polished as the real thing, but still a neat novelty to this day, especially the expanded console ports. There was also Kirby Fighters Deluxe, which originated as a minigame in Kirby Triple Deluxe before becoming its own dedicated spin-off that even got a sequel on the Switch. Once again, not as good as the real thing, but, you know, a nice novelty. What else is there? Uh, WWE? I mean, All Stars is great, but who the hell played it on 3DS? There might be some other random eShop titles I'm forgetting too. Oh, but when it comes to cancelled fighting games, well, as far as I'm aware of, there's only one. Arika, the developers of the Street Fighter EX series and the 99 series on Switch, made a tech demo called Fighting Sample over to 3DS, featuring characters from EX. Unfortunately, this never got greenlit into a full title, which is a shame because the small amount of gameplay released for it looks pretty great for the handheld. Thankfully, a true successor to the EX series would be released several years later with Fighting EX Lair, which saw a port to the Nintendo Switch earlier this year. Every now and then for the past few years, there are times when I randomly think about all these mysterious fighting game ports from the early life of the 3DS. It was just so interesting to see developers give so much support for a specific genre over a short period of time. Handheld fighting games in general are a really fascinating topic to me and I'd love to look into them on other platforms in the future. I'd probably start by going down the rest of Nintendo's consoles. The DS has a lot, and I mean a lot, of unique anime fighters. Several that aren't great, but also some pretty impressive ones too. The GBA also has a bunch of pretty cool ports, as well as a few weird one-offs like Tekken Advance. I'd probably also want to look into the PSP and Vita as well, since they have a lot of good ports, and I mentioned a few of them in this video. But I'd save those for a way later, since most of those are pretty identical to their console counterparts if they weren't stuff I already covered here with Tekken 3D and Blaze Blue. Maybe I should just go back to playing Cross Tank or something other shit on my Switch. See ya!